welcome. Welcome to this time and place. We are missing um, all of our tech deacons today. And so I'm, I'm trusting that what we need will be here. And if we have glitches along the way that you will um, just put up with it and persevere and I will persevere on my end and we will get through it together. This is the time when we uh, share announcements. So I would ask if anyone has an announcement to make, if you would unmute yourself and do that now, please. I'm not seeing any. While you might be thinking of what you may have, I do have a couple of them. I shared in the bulletin that I sent out in the EBC um, announced that there's a service this afternoon at Del Mar Presbyterian and on Facebook Live that is um, an ecumenical service in comm commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the events of 9-11. That uh, is a service that Emmanuel is the co-host for. So you can go to our Facebook page or you can go to the Del Mar Presbyterian Facebook page, or you can attend in person if you let them know that you were coming. That's at three o'clock today. The other important announcement that I sent was that this week is Pickett Simpson's birthday, and he remains in care, long-term care now for uh, his COVID infection. The infection itself is long past, but it's his birthday, and at one time, they had thought that he might get to come home before his birthday, but he's not going to. So I would encourage you as you are able uh, to send birthday cards to him this week. My last announcement is that we begin today the worship series called Unraveled. This week, you will receive on your doorstep or in your mailbox if you live at a distance a little packet with some material to help us worship together from our, our own spaces. What's mostly going to be in that packet are strips of fabric with instructions for what to do with them. You will see some glimpses of those pieces of fabric on the communion table in a slide today. Uh, so when you see those and you wonder what those are, know that they are coming to you and you can hold them up in a see them live and in person. The other, the other piece that can come to you if you ask for it is a prayer study journal that's related to our series. It looks like this, it's a booklet. Um, and inside it has a piece of art and a written reflection for every day and some questions uh, and a space to journal in it. So if you have already asked for one, it has been printed out for you and, and is in your packet, which will come to you this week. If you have not asked for one and you want one, we would love to make those available for you. It would be super, super helpful if you could let me know today. You could put that in the chat or you could send me an email. Um, if you want it, it would be really helpful if I knew by tomorrow because it takes a little bit of time to print them and Dorothy will do that and then put them in the packets for those who are delivering those this week. So if you want a prayer journal to use for the series, uh, please let me know. I think that's all of my announcements. Is there anybody else who has one to make now? Okay, I am not seeing any hands on the screen. So let us prepare to worship together.
Our theme for this season is unraveling. And we have um, a children's time video that explores some of what that word means and how, how it works. English is a strange language. Let me show you what I mean. Take the word tie. What is the opposite of tie? How about happy? What's the opposite of happy? Lots of words work this way. Made and unmade. Twist and untwist. Real and unreal. Here is a word you may not know. Ravel. Ravel is a weird word because ravel and unravel mean the same thing. Ravel means to take cloth apart. And unravel means the same thing. Sometimes, when our plans are falling apart, we say that they are unraveling. We feel like everything is a mess. But every mess is a possibility. And God is with us, even when life is messy. God can help us take an unraveled mess and make something new. You can always trust God to be with you when life gets messy. That's a promise that comes from God through Jesus. Honest. Thank Judy for creating that raveling, unraveling theme exploration. And we will continue to deal with that theme for these next several weeks. We have a call to worship today, which will be read aloud for us by the uh, Garters and the Huts. And I invite the rest of us to stay muted but to uh, read aloud, join in where we are. In worship, um, may, may we I be as welcoming as Sarah and, and Abraham, Abraham who, who were quick to serve the stranger. stranger. In faith, may, may we proclaim that nothing is too big for God. God. In moments of holy surprise, May we laugh and deep abiding joy. For God is in the holy surprise. God is in the winding path. And God is in our presence today. Let us worship the holy God.
We begin here, coming just as we are. And so that is what our Emmanuel singers are singing about. Let us pray. Holy One, we are here just as we are with all our faith and flaws and foibles. God, this life is a tapestry of moments woven together, and we long to be weavers of your love. Today we gather and pray that you would unravel our biases, unravel our assumptions, unravel whatever it is that keeps us from you. Clear space in our hearts for your spirit, for your word, for your surprising presence. We are here just as we are. We are listening. We are praying together 
as Jesus taught us. Our Father and Mother who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading includes two passages from the book of Genesis today, and Barb is going to read our first one. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 15 from the New International Version. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered, do as you say. <clears throat> so Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared <clears throat> and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, am I worn out and my Lord is old? Will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid. So she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. The second reading comes from Genesis 21. And that one has been prepared for us by Rory Garner. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the very time God had promised him, Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham cursed him, circumcised him, as God commanded him, Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought, brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. We appreciate that, Rory. Our hymn is one that was written by John Bell. It is not a song that we have sung before. Uh, so it may be unfamiliar at first, but it is a song that celebrates the role of women in the um, 
in the history of the world and the history of, of God's people. So, and it also has a lot of verses. So I would invite you to listen to the first verse, but then to join in as soon as you pick up the melody. a line of women extending back to me whose bones shaping history not only could conceive and though they went the stages their witness was repressed God value and encouraged them whom the world was blessed so sing a song of Sarah to laughter she gave birth and sing a song of Tehran who stood for women's word. So sing the song of Hannah, who bargained with the Lord, and sing the song of Mary, who bore and bred God's word. There is a line of women who took on powerful men, defying laws and scruples to let life live again. And though despite their triumph, their story stayed untold, God kept their number growing, created strong and bold. So sing a song of Shemron, with their heart close at hand. Engaged to kill their children, they foiled the king's command. And sing a song of Rahab, who sheltered spies and mine. And sing a song of Esther, preventing genocide. A line of women who stood by Jesus' side, who housed him while he ministered and held him while he died. And though they claimed he prison, their news was deep suspect, till Jesus stood among them, his woman they had left. So sing a song of Anna, who saw Christ in the face. And sing a song of Martha, who gave him food and space. And sing a song of Mary's, who hated his request. And now in heaven's banquet, our Jesus fondest guest. We come to our time of prayer and sharing together. And I would invite you to put prayer concerns into the chat or to unmute yourselves. Um, it might work well if, if you would raise your hands and I can call on you so we're not speaking on top of each other. Let's pray together. Oh God, our rock. We rejoice in you. Holy One, we take strength from being in your presence. On this anniversary weekend, the first one in 20 years when our nation is not formally at war, we pray for peace. We pray that your peace would shatter the weapons of war that your justice would humble those who fill themselves to overflowing, that those who are starving now would find food in abundance. We pray for lives that feel barren, for hearts that are bereaved, for all who are trapped by the power of death. We pray, Lord, for these dear ones, these who have, we have named who are close to our hearts, we pray especially for these children who are members of our own faith community, especially God, we pray for those suffering from depression. We pray for those recovering from COVID, including Ruth's brother-in-law. For Ian's brother in the hospital, 
We pray for those in pain, those looking for treatment, those seeking good discernment about decisions and medical decisions and other kinds of life decisions, God. We pray for those who seek your presence and find you elusive. We give thanks for Pickett and Edie and the strength of their relationship. And we pray a special blessing for Pickett on his birthday. For all these we have named and those we have not named out loud, but who we carry in our hearts, we ask for your loving care, for your guidance, for your strength and courage, and for laughter. Wondrous God, deep in our hearts, so deep that most of the time we don't even repeat it to ourselves. Deep in our hearts is a prayer for something we need to happen. Something too wonderful for the likes of people like us to accomplish, or maybe even to imagine. But something that needs to happen for us and for our world to be wholly what we are. Give us again the great hope that the day is coming when the impossible will become possible and the laughter of our despair will be turned into the laughter of greatest joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sarah, the biblical Sarah, is beautiful. Drop dead gorgeous. I never really considered that before. When she was 65, the Pharaoh of Egypt saw her and wanted her. I guess my ageism is showing. Sarah's part in the biblical narrative happens when she is advanced in years and somehow I never stopped to consider what she might have looked like. This week, I came across this picture of Stasha Foley. She's 102 here. Now, I know that Stasha Foley is a white American woman of today and that Sarah was an ancient Middle Easterner. But now this is my biblical image, my image, my mental image of the biblical Sarah. This picture of Mrs. Foley was taken on the occasion of a good surprise. She was in hospice care at 102. Her daughter, granddaughter Tara was engaged to be married and Mrs. Foley was not well enough to travel and would not live to the date of the wedding. So her granddaughter traveled from Texas to Florida. She brought along her wedding dress. She put on her makeup and her jewelry just to surprise her with one last visit. And Tara didn't tell anyone what she was going to do. And she didn't tell anyone for months that this had happened. On her wedding day, several 
months later, she surprised her family with these pictures of herself with her grandmother in her wedding dress. It was a very good surprise. I think about Stasha Foley, radiant at 102, and about all that her life had held. And I think about Sarah and all that her life had held. Sarah never had children. Infertility, the absence of children to parents who want them is such a painful thing, even today. In Sarah's time, it was additionally complicated because a woman's worth was intricately connected to her ability to bear children. The years kept passing without the appearance of a child, lowering Sarah's self-esteem and status further and further every year. It was a grief and a burden that she carried always, everywhere she went. When they went to Egypt, her beauty was a liability and Abraham failed to protect her. He anticipated that powerful men might want her. He anticipated that they might kill him to get her. So he told her to say that she was his sister, not his wife. He allowed the Pharaoh to take her like she was his wife. Abraham even profited from it, accepting the gifts of sheep and oxen and donkeys and servants in exchange. He not only got to stay alive, he got rich, while Sarah had no say about it. Sarah was a survivor of sexual violence and of abandonment, domestic abuse by her partner. So she carried that trauma on top of everything else. As the years went by, a decade passed and there was still no baby. So Sarah convinced Abraham to take Hagar as his second wife. Hagar bore him a son, but Sarah's plan backfired. Hagar became contemptuous of Sarah and Sarah became jealous of Hagar and abusive to her. Sarah is beautiful. She has the rank of first wife, but her beauty and status have not led to an easy life. In some ways, the opposite has been true. Like all human beings, Sarah is a complex character with a range of life experiences. She has painful memories and undoubtedly behaviors of which she is not proud. And maybe she appears tough, even cynical on the outside. Maybe cynicism is the armor she has learned to wear in a world where she failed at the one thing that was expected of her. The, the one thing that would have made her normal, which is to be a mother and grandmother. And then there comes the day when the strangers arrive at the Oaks of Mamre. Sarah is in the tent listening to their conversation. She hears them talking about her, saying that she will have a son now when she's 90 years old. And she laughs. Of course she laughs, wouldn't you? She laughs because the idea is so ridiculous. A few decades earlier, it would have been the best possible news, but now it's painful. It's laughable. She laughs because she knows her own body very well, much better than those strange men out there who are making pronouncements about it. She laughs because she has seen the hard side of life and nothing much surprises her anymore, but this does. 
there's a mystery around these strangers. Sometimes it seems that there are three of them, clearly messengers from God. And then sometimes it is just the Lord who speaks. After Sarah laughs, God asks Abraham why she laughed. And Sarah lies and says she didn't do it. But God insists that she really did laugh. Now, in the previous chapter, God had announced Sarah's impending pregnancy just to Abraham. And Abraham had fallen on his face laughing about it. God did not chastise Abraham for laughing. But it is common to read this chapter as if God is angry with Sarah for doing that. One scholar says, that God descends here to a, uh, no, I did not, yes, you did, no, I didn't, squabble with Sarah. And that tells us that this narrative is supposed to be funny. Sarah is not to be afraid. For as she proclaims in chapter 21, God has brought laughter for her. Everyone who hears will laugh with her. It would be easy right now to sink into doubt, to wrap ourselves in cynicism because everything is hard. Pain and suffering is deep and real everywhere, all over the globe. But there are also genuine surprises, moments of delight and joy. Maybe you heard about the Afghan woman who went into labor with complications on an evacuation flight. The other women on the plane stood around her holding up sh their shawls to give her a modicum of privacy in a place like this. And the pilot descended to an altitude which increased the air pressure, stabilizing her and probably saving her life. Upon landing in Germany, she gave birth still inside the plane. She gave birth to a baby girl who they named Reach. Reach was the airplane's call sign. After all that that woman had endured, I can imagine her laughing with relief and joy. Another image you may have seen, excuse me, just a minute. Something came unplugged, pardon me. Another image you may have seen was this Afghan girl skipping on the tarmac after her family made it to Belgium. I don't know whether she is old enough to understand what she escaped, but the millions of people who have seen this viral photo have some sense of it. God has brought laughter for me. Sarah said. The message of this story is not that God will deliver faithful people from infertility if they wait long enough and pray hard enough. The message is not that having faith eliminates suffering. Those are cruel interpretations which ignore the messiness of the circumstances in which real people live. They ignore the complexity of human beings who are simultaneously faithful and flawed. I would submit that the message of this story is that God is a God of surprise, good surprise. Yes, the catastrophe in Afghanistan is real. The suffering of those who have endured hurricanes and fires and earthquakes is real. We lament and mourn for them, but we can still rejoice with that girl skipping in Belgium. I love good surprises. They are kind of rare in my life, but I had one last week. I told you that Jim and I over the Labor Day weekend were at the Wild Goose Festival 
you've heard me talk about this before. I go to this festival mostly for what I learn. I go for the workshops that are held during the day. I go to learn about the activism of progressive Christians. I go to absorb what people are doing around issues like immigration or creation justice or mass incarceration. I also go for conversations that I don't get in other places, conversations with people who have been wounded, those who have left the institutional church but who haven't entirely given up on Jesus yet. They have a lot of important things to say. I go to other things, other events for preaching and worship. I don't go to the festival for preaching and worship because frankly, they don't have very much of it, but that's okay because that's not why I'm there. But even so, I was a little irked when we arrived on the last morning for what should have been, what the schedule said was a keynote presentation followed by closing worship. And they announced a change of plans. The expected preacher had not made it to the festival, so the keynoter was now going to preach. And a team of three people were going to share the keynote presentation slot. Well, I was not pleased. I had already heard the presentation by one of those three people and I really didn't care to hear it again. Plus, I had wanted to hear the original keynote for the whole hour and not for the 20 minutes or so that she might get for a sermon. I was cynical. This was not a good way to end. What were the festival organizers thinking? Of course, as you have already anticipated, I was wrong about many things, but in a very big way about the sermon. The preacher started off by making us laugh. She was witty. I was admiring her craft and trying to take notes so I could repeat it for you sometime. But she went too fast and I gave up on taking notes, which was good because it enabled me to be fully present in the moment. One minute we were laughing at Jesus' disciples. I mean, really laughing out loud because she was quite funny. And then she took a turn and all of a sudden, we realized that we were guilty of the same behaviors that we were laughing at. So then we were laughing at ourselves, but really it wasn't very funny anymore. A couple of times she said that she didn't know why she was there, why she had even been invited to speak at this festival. But from the attention of the crowd, it was obvious that the spirit of God was on her and moving among us. She drew me in deeper and deeper. I became aware that I was hearing truth preached boldly and vulnerably. And more than once, I just had to wipe my face. I didn't even realize that I was crying. Friends, this was the most powerful worship experience I've had in a long time. Such a good surprise. And not just for me, not just for the crowd. During the music which followed the sermon, I saw the preacher take a big cloth and wipe her own face. And the next day she tweeted, Yesterday, I cried in front of a large group of people, and then I cried on a plane a little more. Okay, a lot more. I was that lady weeping on the plane. Laughter, tears, truth, unexpected grace, delivered by a preacher who didn't even know why she was there. The God of surprise showed up despite my cynicism, despite my desire to keep to the posted schedule. 
And then there was communion. The station near us, uh, nearest us had a long line. So I just remained in my seat for a while. And after a bit, I noticed that there was another station with a shorter line off to my left. So I got up and went over there. The way the line was set up, because of the crowd, I couldn't see who was serving until the moment when it was my turn to receive. And then I realized that standing in front of me, holding out the bread, was a trans woman. And I immediately remembered the story of another wild goose com communion that I shared with you just a few weeks ago. And I just chuckled to myself about God's sense of humor. Just a little extra surprise thrown in there. So friends, here is the part where I might say, go, go and have a good surprise this week. But of course, you can't manufacture surprise. It just doesn't work like that. But here's what we can do. We can allow ourselves to be open, to receive the surprise when it comes our way, to relax the cynicism or world weariness or despair or doubt that we wear like armor. What we might do, what we might attempt every day is to embrace the question, is anything too hard? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? What we might do is in spite of everything, to allow ourselves to hope, to wonder, to delight, to accept goodness in the midst of pain. And perhaps in God's own time, we may be graced with laughter. Thanks be to God. Amen. We cannot manufacture surprise for ourselves, but we can begin with wonder and gratitude. And our closing hymn invites us to do both. Oh, my God. 
Thank you as always for your presence and participation. I would just remind you that if you want a prayer journal, please let me know that in the next 24 hours or so. And um, now would you receive a benediction? May the Lord Christ go before you to prepare your way. Christ beside you be companion to you everywhere you go. Christ beneath you to strengthen and sustain you when you fall or fail. Christ behind you to finish and complete what you must leave undone. Christ within you to give you courage and faith, hope and love. But mostly, Christ above bless and keep you now and evermore. Amen. Today we have a postlude, which Michael has provided for us. And I would invite you to stick around beyond that time if you wish to uh, stay on and greet each other.